Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this virtual stage where I'll be taking you on a behind the scenes tour of black holes. Uh, I'm Dr. Emily Saint-Ange. I normally lecture at uh, University College London. Uh, but today my role is to serve as a kind of guide to show you some of the science uh, behind black holes, as well as some of uh, the technology. I think when it comes to black holes, I personally cannot make my mind up whether what I find most fascinating is whether the fact that these things even exist, right, that there are such things as black holes out there in space, or the fact that we have been able to build some incredibly complex machines and develop some mind-blowing theories to be able to comprehend black holes and find evidence for them. So I will present you both of these things and I will let you be the judge of you know, what you think is the most fascinating part of this uh, black hole story. So to get us started, I've put a, an image here of a supermassive black hole, not a real one, one for the movies. Um, if you have seen, you will recognize this as the supermassive black hole. That's a, a key uh, a protagonist in the movie Interstellar. And I feel confident showing you this because this is a, the amount of work and care that has gone in producing this image for the movie is actually so good that it, it is a scientifically accurate uh, representation of a supermassive black hole. Until about a year ago, that's all I had at my disposal if I were to talk about black holes. I couldn't show anybody an actual image of black hole. But that changed drastically about a year ago when we finally got the first image of a supermassive black hole. Now, remember when that came out at first in the news, there was a, you know, reactions from the public saying, oh, well, that image, it's, it's a bit rubbish, isn't it? You can't see anything. It's all a bit blurry. Um, whereas for us as scientists, it was just an absolute uh, revelation. And hopefully, you know, by the end of the talk, you'll appreciate uh, just how amazing this image is, especially if you were in that camp of being slightly underwhelmed when you might first have seen it. So before we go into any of that, just so we know Black Holes 101, just some basic uh, facts about it. So what is a black hole? Well, black hole a black hole is, you know, in some sense, a mathematical construct. So black holes really took off um, the beginning of the 20th century when Einstein wrote down the equations for general relativity. And from that point, there was, you know, almost an arms race to just solving that equation. So Einstein providing with the framework and then all sorts of different physicists tried to solve the equation to find all sorts of things about, you know, the universe. And one of those solutions that you find to the equation is something that is a black hole. So a mathematical singularity, meaning a single point where it, the curvature of space-time caused by general relativity becomes infinite. In other words, it's a point in space where all the mass is located in an infinitely small volume, meaning you get something with an infinite density. It's almost a mathematical impossibility, something you can describe with an equation, but if you think about it in terms of physical terms, it makes no sense. How can something have infinite density? Yet this is what you know, a black hole is based on these equations. So for a long time, the black holes were seen just as a quirky mathematical construct. Yes, it's a solution of these equations, but it cannot be, you know, it's, it's it's not, but as I'll show you now, we have clear evidence that these things are true. So when you think about the black hole, so the singularity, that is that point of infinite density, that is the black hole itself. But often when we think about the black hole, we think of it as having a radius of finite size, and that's what we call the event horizon. The event horizon is the closest anything can get to a black hole and ever escape, right? So even light who travels at the fastest speeds we think anything can reach in the universe, if it crosses within the event horizon, it's done. It cannot never go out. Gravity is so strong, it will pull it in towards a singularity. What's really interesting, however, is that there's nothing special about the event horizon. If we were, you know, an astronaut somehow had managed to go there and see it, we would cross the event horizon um, and nothing notice absolutely nothing. There's nothing special about the event horizon. And that's a fundamental thing that general relativity requires, that there's nothing special about the event horizon. Um, other than the fact that, you know, once you cross it, there's no coming out. But you wouldn't know that if you were at that point. Um, so I've put these three words at the bottom left corner, mass, spin, and charge. And that's to highlight a fundamental uh, quirk and something quite interesting about black holes. So people came up with something they called the no hair theorem. Um, it was coined as 
you know, black holes are so featureless that it's like a bald head with no hair. And don't ask me more <laughs> why it's called like that. But it, it basically says that black holes can be uniquely described by three numbers only. Their mass, that's quite clear. The spin, which is the word we use to mean the speed at which something is rotating. And the charge, which is electric charge, whether it's positive or negatively charged. And that what the theory says is that you can uniquely describe a black hole based on only these three numbers. And that, that is really, really unusual, right? If I take um, something, I have my phone here, and then I have this mug, right? Um, they both have the same mass, roughly. I can make them spin at the same rate. Um, neither have an electric charge, or I could pre pretend they have the same electric charge. But clearly, you, everybody can see that you know, that's a phone, that's a that's a mug. They're not the same. And the reason is that to describe them, we would need a lot more numbers than just these three numbers, right? We need something to describe what they're made of, their shape, and so on and so on. So it's quite strange that black holes are so simple, right? And that leads to fundamental problems, a ma ma major crisis in modern physics, right? So you've probably heard of how in physics we have these two massive pillars, right? We have general relativity that describes the science of the infinitely large space, everything like that. And then we have quantum mechanics that delves into the infinitely small uh, things at you know, atomic levels. And these two theories are in themselves wonderful. They explain you know, most everything we know about the universe. The problem is that we do not have a language for both of them to communicate easily and to form one single physical theory. And there's almost nowhere where that's most obvious than when thinking about black holes. So quantum uh, physics has something they like, they, they have, you know, you've heard about conservation of energy, right? these kinds of principles where energy is not created or destroyed. There's a similar thing in quantum physics that's called the conservation of information, whereas information can never be destroyed. So, um, for example, if that's the, the problem with this, with the black holes, and like, again, if I go back to my example here, um, if I were to, you know, send my phone, my phone were to fall into a black hole, the, ma the black hole would grow in mass by the equivalent mass of my phone. Then if I were to throw my mug in, it would grow in mass by the equivalent amount of mass. So that means as an outside observer, when I look at the black hole, I would say, okay, the black hole has grown by this much mass, but I couldn't tell if it's because it has absorbed a phone or a mug or, you know, anything more realistic in outer space. So information, all these extra numbers I needed to describe these two things have been lost, right? They've been lost when they go into the black hole. And that's a huge issue for quantum mechanics because information has been lost. There's all sorts of ways to reconcile this paradox, but no matter how we do it at the moment, you have to give up on some of the fundamental principles of general relativity or quantum mechanics. So I won't go any further in this. That's a super interesting uh, topic. But for now, let me talk to you about the astrophysics of black hole, what we know about them. So there's a, black holes are the basic are not all that mysterious. There's an easy way to form them, right? So when stars are born, they you have stars of different masses, small stars and big stars. And then they spend most of their lifetimes just doing nuclear fusion, turning hydrogen into helium and so on at their cores. And when they run out of fuel, at that point, there is no more internal pressure to support the enormous mass of the star. So the star starts to collapse on itself. And for stars that are very massive, there is so much mass that wants to collapse on itself and nothing to stop it from collapsing, that it will collapse to the point of the singularity, that point of infinite density. So we know quite well how to form, you know, what we call a solar mass black hole. So you take something that has the same mass as the sun, which you see here, just for reference, you know, this is the earth down here to scale. And then if we were to compress the sun down into a black hole, its event horizon would be about this big, you know, a few kilometers across. I put it on the map of London here for reference. It fits well within the M25, well within central London. So it's a crazy amount of mass in a very small amount of space. So we have these small stellar mass black hole. We know how to form them. They're just the natural end product of the lifetime of a star. The question is how can we then convert these into the supermassive black holes that we observe at the center of most galaxies? 
Well, one easy way to do it, which is, okay, you start with a small black hole and you have it eat, you, you feed it with gas and stars and all sorts of things like that. And you let it grow until it becomes, you know, a monster millions of times the mass of the sun. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.